Good morning, evening, afternoon, everyone. I am Dorm. This is Dorm Streams, and welcome back to the Games of the Decade list. Today, we are taking a look at games 50 through 41. We're officially halfway done, kind of. And uh, before we get started, if you're wondering why there's been such a gap between these two videos, uh, I would like to present Exhibit A to the court. My SD card reader broke. Uh, I don't know if you can see if the camera will autofocus, but that thing is bent. Uh, it is it is completely, completely useless now. So, uh, yeah, so that's why that's why it's been a little while to get the, the footage off the camera that I'm using right now. I have to use an SD card reader anyway. Without further ado, let's get into it. Number 50, The Witness. The Witness is an indie puzzle game unlike any other game that I think I've ever played. Uh, it is made by Jonathan Blow, the man who made Braid, uh, which is another sort of beloved indie title. The Witness is a little bit more complicated than Braid. So you you play as just this nameless character. You play as yourself, I guess. And you're, you're, you're going through this island, you're, and the only way you can move through the world is through walking and solving these little puzzles. Now, they are, they are almost little mazes, I guess would be the best way to say it. Basically, the idea is that you have these little circles that you have to connect to, like, end points. Um, and then through that, you have to abide by certain rules. So, at first, it's more of a maze, and it's more labyrinthian. Uh, toward the end, it becomes more like Minesweeper or something. There are numbers and elements you have to deal with. Um, but the puzzles are all really unique. The island is divided into a bunch of different areas, like sub areas, and each sub area has its own theme. One of them is like sound based that somehow relates to the puzzles. One of them is more based on like symmetry and solving two puzzles at once. One of them is based on uh, solving puzzles around the environment in front of you. Uh, the camera perspective is, is really important in this game, and that's one, one place where this game shines. I don't know if you can tell from me like raving about it as much as I am, but it is so, so good. Uh, one of my favorite puzzle games of the decade. It landed here because I don't think it's for everybody. I don't think this game is exactly everybody's cup of tea. There are some weird like story things that are about sort of existence and very like philosophical, really heady stuff going on that I think kind of is whatever. Some people are going to love that. It just for me was just kind of a whatever element for some people to probably detract. But there is no real story. It's really just solving the puzzles, going through the game and uh and it really just shines on the back of how clever these puzzles are. I know with a lot of puzzle games, um, Portal is a good example of this where, you know, you get this this certain one concept and then they keep iterating on it and using it in clever ways. Uh, the Witness is the perfect example of that. You get this maze element, you understand it pretty quickly. And then you, even early on, it's almost like a Metroidvania in some ways. You see these puzzles, you're like... I can try this now, but how the hell do I do it? I have no idea. And then uh, eventually you'll come upon the area that tutorializes that and then you can go back. It's just oh, it's so, so good. I don't want to talk too much about the puzzle elements because that's kind of the fun of the game in itself. Um, but it's frustrating in all the right ways and it's rewarding in definitely all the right ways. So absolutely, absolutely wholeheartedly love the witness. And that's why it's number 50. Number 49, The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. So my experiences with Skyrim are a lot is, a di is different than a lot of people's. When I played Skyrim, uh, I was a huge Fallout person. I, I loved Fallout 3. It's, as I've said, one of my favorite games of all time. Um, not this decade, so I can freely say that without spoiling anything. Uh, but I love all the Fallout games and up until this point, and this was my first uh, Elder Scrolls game. I had never played an Elder Scrolls game. All my friends were talking about it. This was like freshman year in high school sometime around then. And I just remember everybody being so excited for this game and uh, talking about it like at the lunchroom or in class and stuff like that. It was definitely one of those zeitgeist games. So I picked it up because I loved Fallout and I knew it was like basically medieval Fallout uh, in a similar way to if you watch the full series, my Witcher review. This this game landed here partially because I respect it so much, uh, even though I may not consider it one of my favorite games of all time. It is such a well-made game and it's a game people are still playing and still modding and still has a fervent Twitch community and people still just talk about Skyrim and love Skyrim. I really enjoyed Skyrim. I, it was one of those games that I would come home, couldn't wait to come home from school and play. Um, it's not have it's not had quite the longevity for me. It's had for some people where they're still playing it, but Skyrim's fantastic. I don't have to say too much about it. It's an open world Bethesda game where you go around, you can kill dragons, you can do spells, you can seduce people, you can mod literally anything you want into it now. Uh, it's it's just a fantastic sandbox game. And for the time, especially felt so open and, and just important as and maybe that was because of my friends playing it, but it just felt so real and like it mattered in a way that few games do. So 
Uh, yeah, shout out to Skyrim. Again, it's one of those games I don't have to say much about because you probably already know what Skyrim is coming into it, but Skyrim's fantastic. Number 48, a normal lost phone. Ooh, a mobile game. Well, that means it's got to be something interesting. So a normal lost phone is a mobile game. You can also play it on Steam and I think now on Switch. I think they recently I follow the developers on Twitter and I think they recently uh, released this game and its sequel game on Switch. I don't want to talk too much about a normal lost phone because the importance of it is sort of derived as you are playing the game. Uh, The player kind of understands what's happening as you go on. But it's basically the concept of it is that you find someone's phone, right? You find just a lost phone and you're going through it basically trying to figure out what happened to the person or, um, you know, who it belongs to or whatever. You were you were just going through someone else's phone. So the on mobile, it plays like you're on a phone home screen. Uh, but of course, you're not on your actual phone screen. It's 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 in a game. But. You know, you have your messages to look through, you have emails, you have social media posts, you have the internet browser, you have a lot of that kind of stuff. And this is the kind of narrative game that I just, oh, I I flood to. I, I just go to it whenever I hear of anything like this. This is one of those games, uh, very similar to another game later in the list, that was one of those games where people are just saying, hey, don't look up anything about this game, just play it. Um, I think Greg Miller was the person that recommended it to or recommended it to his audience. And I saw that and was the reason I picked it up because I don't normally play mobile games unless everybody's talking about them. Um, and you'll see a couple of those. I'm not like anti mobile game. They just kind of have to be special like Monument Valley early in the list. And uh, there's another game later. But um, this game is so, so special. It talks about topics that I had never played through as a game as a gamer before. It's so important feeling. Um, and as you're playing it, I couldn't help but be emotional. I I I very vividly remember being on my mom's couch, being home for the weekend, either from school or just coming home to visit and just saying like, okay, this game's about an hour and a half, something like that. I'm just going to play it. I just remember laying down on my mom's couch, feet up on the the arm of the couch and just like playing through it and just absolutely loving my time with it. It's a very cheap game. It goes on sale all the time. I've seen it for as low as like a dollar before on Steam. Um, It is absolutely worth your time. If you like that sort of narrative experience, experiencing something through someone else's eyes or through the lens of another character absolutely pick it up it's a wonderful indie game wonderful indie devs and uh i think you'll be surprised where the story goes i was and that's part of the reason i love it i'm not going to spoil that here but um yeah i cannot recommend that game enough number 47 pt i bet people were not expecting this game to be on my list this is the game I got the least far in to make this list, but I don't think this is one of those games when I talked about in the very in the very first episode of this episode, you know, one, the 100 through 91 games. I sort of mentioned that there are some games that are so important, they have to be mentioned, um, no matter if I love them or not. Uh, The Witcher is one of those games. Persona 5 is one of those games. Not that I don't love both of those games. I liked both of those games a lot, but they didn't like gravitate to me, but I still felt like they were so meaty and so important to the decade as a whole that you have to acknowledge them. Uh, That's this game. PT is was a cultural phenomenon for a while. Uh, You can still find people selling their PS4s if they have PT downloaded because you can't download it anymore. You can find people selling those for crazy amounts of money because people are still so fervent for this game. People are remaking PT in dreams now so people can play it. Uh, PT is just such a zeitgeist moment. If you were watching like Achievement Hunter or Kind of Funny or any of those kinds of uh, gaming YouTube channels, you they probably played through it. Um, I know I watched several people play through it. Yeah, it was like the horror defining moment of this decade, in my opinion, because without it, I don't think we get games like Visage or a lot of the other like really popular Twitch horror games that I've seen now. I think PT influenced a whole generation of horror games uh, and even like some of the the more modern AAA stuff like the like Resident Evil 7 and stuff seem to reference PT in a way like you're it just goes to you being in a house now as opposed to, you know, shooting zombies all over the place. Uh, I think PT changed the landscape. I think it was genuinely the creepiest thing I've ever played. There is a moment in the game. I, I don't care to spoil because I don't think it's that spoilery. There's a moment in the game where uh, a voice just comes over this sort of radio on the background and goes, look behind you. And it scared the crap out of me. And I couldn't shake it for like three days. Uh, <laughs> this game is genuinely scary. And again, it's even if I didn't play all the way through it, I'm never going to play all the way through horror games. There are very few that I've beaten. I still respect the hell out of it. And respect what it was able to do and the passion behind it. And of course, you know, we never got Silent Hills, but in a way, this is almost better than that. If we had gotten the full game, everybody would kind of look at it like, oh, yeah, the demo was great. And then the game was maybe it was great or maybe it was just like, eh, the, the demo was better. 
Now it's this weird cult classic kind of thing. And I, I think it deserves to be acknowledged on a list like this. So that's that's why it's here. Number 46, Ori and the Blind Forest. So as it sits, I've not played Ori and the Will of the Wisps, the sequel that just came out. Uh, but it doesn't count for this decade because it came out in 2020. But but I loved Ori and the Blind Forest. It's just a whimsical, beautiful Metroidvania. The game isn't super hard, in my opinion. Um, I love Metroidvanias. That's one of my favorite genres, as you'll see over and over again in this list. It's it's not the challenge that's the, that you're there for. The story is almost Pixar movie esque. There's sort of this not a lot of communication, but you definitely feel for some of these characters and you definitely can get a sense of the relationship of a lot of these characters, as well as just how freaking pretty this game is. The game is like a painting. Um, it's very whimsical, very like sort of flowy and organic looking, but all these cool neon colors as well. Uh, the visuals of this game are gangbusters. They're so good. And like any good Metroidvania, you know, you're going through the map over and over again. There are these huge boss fights that are more like running sequences. I know I know a few people are not a fan of those. I really liked them. I think it emphasized how strong the bosses were that you're both you're mostly running. But yeah, Ori is just it's so pretty. It's I, I keep coming back to the aesthetics of that game, but I think it is one of the prettiest games of the decade without without question. And it's just absolutely gorgeous. And the gameplay is all there. Some of the abilities are really interesting that I had never seen before. There's like some zapping abilities. Um, you can go like corner to corner really fast. Like the movement gets really fluid in the late game of that game. And I think they do a good job of escalating the difficulty. Like I said, it's not too hard. Maybe that's painted by the fact that I've been playing Hollow Knight recently, but uh, it's nothing too, too crazy in the difficulty spectrum. It's just just a well-made Metroidvania that is always going to be worth your time if you like the genre, and that's pretty much it. Number 45, Antichamber. Okay, so now I think we've hit the first game that I've used as a verb. Um, <laughs> so I I use Antichamber uh, to refer to a specific things in games. So we'll get there in a minute. Antichamber is a first-person puzzle game that is uh, where you're basically trying to escape this building i guess um this this area and the puzzles are like break your mind levels of environmental puzzles so think of it like portal but there are no portals but every way you move and the every way you orient your camera and then later on you get some some elements that you you have to add to the puzzles all of that stuff matters and it's one of the most like eye opening puzzle experiences I've ever I've ever had. So when I refer to something as antechambering, what I mean is there's a specific thing early on in antechamber where there's a wall with an eye on it. It's like a picture of an eye. And if you turn around and and go back the way you came, because it looks like it's just a dead stop, uh, you can't you can't progress. But if like there's you just hit another wall behind you. But if you look at the eye the whole time and back up, like if your camera stays on the eye, but you walk backwards, then you move to the back of the room. And that is a mechanic that I've seen in other games since. um, And maybe other games did it before. But I just that is just locked in my brain to antechamber. And now anything there's anytime there's anything remotely like that, my brain goes to antechamber. The graphics are really cool. It's sort of this monochromatic style that's really neat with just little pops of color. Um, the puzzles are freaking hard. I don't think I've ever beaten antechamber. I always get like three quarters of the way through it and then I'm like, all right, I'm done. I'm, this hurts my brain. Um, it's cell shaded, but not in a way that makes me motion sick like Borderlands. Uh, but it's just oh, it's such a hard game. It's one of the hardest games on this list, in my opinion. The puzzles are very, very hard but in a fun way. And when you figure them out, you feel like the smartest person on the earth. And so I think that's always a good sign of a puzzle game, right? Is maybe that it's not too easy or not too hard, but that when you solve it, you feel like a genius. Antichamber is that on another level. Uh, whoever made it's a mad scientist. It's insane. But yeah, go play it. It's fantastic. Number 44, Cuphead. This is kind of a blend of the sort of I feel like this game's super important to this decade, and also I really like this game. It's another game I haven't finished, uh, a game I, go, I plan to go back and, and stream all the way through, because uh, I only played through like the first island. The, the game's divided in a bunch of islands. Uh, if you don't know what Cuphead is, it is a... How do you even describe it? A side-scroller beat-em-up centered around big boss fights. Um, there are some like regular levels, like Metroidvania, or, well, just kind of like action platforming levels. Um, but the main the main sort of draw of this game is its boss fights. And like a Dark Souls, like a Hollow Knight, it is very, very centered around the boss fights in difficulty. You're going to spend most of your time redoing these fights over and over and over again. Uh, and it's it's a very hard game. But the big draw of that game, in my opinion, the other big draw is 
pun intended, the drawings. Uh, so this game is hand animated. Uh, each animation was hand drawn out frame by frame to look like an old like 20s or 30s cartoon. And it looks so freaking good. They did such a good job with the overall aesthetic of this game, the overall design of it. It feels like one of those old cartoons, like the soundtracks and the boom bangs, like the there's like text for sound effects that come up and the sound effects sound like an old brass band. Like the overall style of this game is enough for me to recommend it and put it on this list. There's no other game like it. And I think everybody sort of just is still kind of in awe of how cool this game looks. Uh, but the gameplay is fantastic. And I love big boss fights, if you as you've seen on this list. And so this is just another one of those examples of how good a game can be when everything works together. The gameplay is so fun. There's also like local co-op, which I've heard is a nightmare to play with people because the game's so hard. Um, I've only played it solo but i can highly recommend that experience too there's upgrades and there's other stuff going on but mainly just how pretty if you if you go watch this trailer and you aren't impressed by the way this game looks let me know because i will be fascinated by that this game looks so freaking good and plays like a dream as well it is really hard so it's not going to be for everybody but man oh man what a what a wonderful game number 43 doom rip and tear baby rip and tear uh, so it's funny because the time I'm recording this Doom Eternal just came out and everybody ties it with Animal Crossing because they came out on the same day and both brands were like, yeah, OK, Doom and Animal Crossing, those go together. And so it's really funny, the like meme status Doom has taken on. But Doom 2016, not the original Doom, not the, you know, the old PC game, but the the reboot is one of the most fun shooters and maybe most fun period games I've ever played. That game is so freaking frantic and fun. You you go through you basically go through hell with a gun and you're just killing demons. And yes, that may sound like what every grandparent thinks every video game is. But this one is so arcadey and there's like actual planning that is involved with it. You can upgrade your guns to get these crazy upgrades. Um, and they're like ra uh, uh, rune challenges where you have to do specific things. There are secret rooms that refer to back to the original Doom. There's a lot of content in this game kind of like hiding in plain sight. When I first played through it, I think I played through it in three streams, like 12 hours was just like that. I never really struggled with it on my first playthrough. But then going back and just like doing all the collectibles for the trophies and stuff, I got the platinum in this game eventually. And I was really impressed by how much content actually is in this game uh, compared to your first playthrough. So I say take your time if, if that's your kind of thing and just enjoy those combat sections because they just feel so fluid. A lot of games, you know, kind of give you those sort of like hunker down and cover mechanics. This game is the exact opposite. It takes every every liberty to keep you moving and incentivize moving. There are some enemies that you basically have to run from the whole time while you're shooting them. Um, this game incentivizes fluid, uh, fluidity and creativity and using all your weapons. I don't know of another game where I didn't just like favor one weapon and actually used my whole wheel, which is a huge testament, not only to how all, all these guns feel incredible, but also just how good they are at incentivizing you to use all of them. Um, there are reasons to use all the guns. And then of course, the more you're using them, the more you like them, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, doom is, it looks cool, but it plays so freaking well. And this is just a solid gameplay game. It's I think it would be a good podcast game, which is my new catchphrase, I guess. The soundtrack's also incredible. I got to make mention of the soundtrack. It's like heavy metal and just fast and vicious and violent. And oh, it's just it's such a mood setting thing. Uh, this music is for how crazy and frantic the game is. And it all just works together beautifully. Number 42, Bastion. Well, I always say in these that there's a game that I wouldn't like on paper that I end up liking, and it's Bastion this time. Uh, it's a super giant game. We saw Pyre from them earlier on this list. We're not we're not done with them yet, but Bastion lands here. Um, if you've never played Bastion or if you've never heard of it, it's kind of a weird game to describe. It's a top down, which that's always the first detractor for me, right? Like that's one of these words that you always hear me say when I don't think I like a game. It's top down. But it's sort of a combat heavy strategy chess like kind of game. Um, it's not turn based, but it's got sort of that element of like, OK, I can see all my enemies quickly. Let me see how I want to take them out. You play as a character just known as the kid and which I love that anyway. I love like nameless protagonists. And you're basically trying to save this town that's floating above the clouds. Um, you live in this super fantasy world, and the motivation is that this thing in the center of your city is, corn of, is sort of splintered out to a bunch of different locations in the map. You kind of have to recollect them 
and in order to like save the town. And so your goal is to go to these locations that these, uh, I guess, crystals, if you want to call them that, have splintered off to. And through it, of course, you meet enemies and you just have to take them down in very tactical ways. This is another game where I found myself using a lot of my inventory. Um, Like most Supergiant games, it kind of leans toward find a loadout you love and until it stops working, just use that. Uh, there, there's a certain loadout that I found very OP. The gameplay is very fun. Um, it makes you feel very smart when you can combine certain things. So like you might have, uh, uh, something that brings enemies into you and then you can use a big hammer for area, for area of effect, or maybe you go more ranged and you shoot off little missiles and then you can, you know, slow them down or something. There are a lot of these, it's been a while since I played Bastion, so I don't know if those are all real. Uh, but there are a lot of these applicable things that you can mix and match to your heart's delight. And that's one of those, it's kind of a hallmark of the early decade, right? Like play how you want to play is, is one of those things that you kept seeing in commercials and stuff. Bastion is a great example of that because you really can customize your toolkit to however you want. The trophies also are very hard. I never got the platinum because there's these challenge rooms that are just insanely difficult, but the gameplay feels so good. The story is actually really good. Supergiant is so good at writing captivating stories uh in games that normally wouldn't have those kinds of stories and this is just another example of how good supergiant is number 41 stardew valley another game i didn't think would be on this list at maybe the beginning of writing it but stardew is just an enigma you play as a farmer and you have a farm it's basically the gamer's version of farmville and it's so freaking good it's like One of those games that always kind of calls my name. I always am kind of thinking about starting a new Stardew playthrough. Um, It's a very relaxed, chill game. There are all these characters you can try to romance and become friends with. And there's a lot to do. You know, a lot of the 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 knocks on these sort of farm sims um, or anything like that is that there's not enough to do. There's tons to do in Stardew. You will always be running out of time and having to go to bed and get up the next day. Uh, The art style is gorgeous. It's this 8 bit or maybe 16-bit, I, I get those confused. It's, it's this sort of pixelated art style that's very reminiscent of older games, but feels super crisp and high def no matter what you play it on. Stardew looks great. It plays great. It's one of those most one of the most comfortable games I've ever played. Um, it's a great anxiety reducer for me personally, just going out, filling your crops, maybe going fishing, maybe going to the caves, coming back, sleeping, and starting the day over again. Another great podcast game, even though the music's really cute. Uh, if you want to just throw it on and do something else, hang out in a Twitch stream, it's good for that too. Stardew is hard to explain why it's so good because it's just so comfy. It's like finding a hoodie that you really love and you just never want to get rid of it, even though you bought it seven years ago and you probably should. It's kind of like that. And that's sort of the, the upside of Stardew. And, uh, yeah, it's just so comfy and I love it. And that's it. Thank you so much for watching. If you did enjoy the video, don't forget to leave it a like and to hit subscribe. Thank you to the patrons over at patreon.com slash stormstreams for supporting this video and making it happen. I love you so much. Thank you for supporting me and being patient while, you know, an SD card reader broke. Uh, But yeah, thank you so much. As always, take care of the girl mom gone and I'll see you all in the next video.